Welcome back. After sufficient bullying from my peers, I finally decided to bite the bullet and subject myself to a terribly good time. For this review, I played through every difficulty as every character, for two main reasons. Reason number first, to accurately review Devil May Cry 2, I need to play all of Devil May Cry 2. And the second reason, because my mama didn't raise no bitch. Which means, I played through the game eight times. Yep. One playthrough per character per difficulty, and two playthroughs for Trish, one for Dante's side, and one for Lucius. And before you ask, I am not okay. Since last time, there has been a number of changes to Dante, most notably his new design, which is still considered one of his best looks to this day. Dante. You see, back in 1873, a small-time content creator by the name of Levi Strauss emigrated from Germany to America. While in America, he met a tailor called Jacob Davis. The two men collaborated together for a number of years and eventually made some truly sick merch. By 1890, they created a revolutionary crisp piece of apparel that changed fashion forever. Named after the Italian city of Genoa, the two men called this pocketed legwear, jeans. With that aside, let's move on to gameplay. When you take control of Dante, you may notice that he runs as if he has a herniated disc. This is known as subtle game design, and is there to encourage you to find more effective means of movement. Not even 10 seconds into gameplay, and it's already a masterpiece. And don't bother trying to move around with Stinger, like in previous games. It, uh... It hurts. After slapping enough buttons, you'll eventually find the Sir Clay Bouton. This gives Dante access to dodge rolls, wall runs, and ground techs, which are actually a foundation for some of Dante's trick style moves in later games. But more importantly, it's faster than whatever this crap is. Combat in this game is very nuanced. You will be spending minutes at a time repeatedly tapping the square button. Over time, your devil trigger will fill up. This is a well-designed mechanic that allows your thumb to take a brief break from grinding cartilage, as you get to hold the button to shoot instead of tapping it. Think of this as a reward for playing well. But the further on you play through the game, the more firearms you unlock until the game rewards you for your bravery, the MP5Ks. Both of these guns are automatics, which means you can hold the button instead of tapping it without losing damage. It's well known that this game uses the hero's journey as a basis for its gameplay narrative. Unlocking these guns towards the end of the game is a respite and could be considered a gift for the hero. You. There is a catch, however. You will find that shooting for prolonged periods may cause pain to your ears. Don't worry though, that pain is just a memory and cells and cut with time. At worst, that's only something that does. Like I said, I'm no coward, but I will need you to speak up a bit. And there's some swords I guess, but they're all the same about using. If you are prone to narcolepsy, you may wake up to find you're low on health. Don't worry, this game got you covered. Because when you're low on health, Dante has a super devil trigger. While in this mode, you are nigh unkillable and do a absolute metric fuck ton of damage. This was also a reused idea for Devil May Cry 5. You also have a couple of cool super moves while in this form. They're not very practical, but hey, they laid the groundwork for better things to come. Level structure is pretty much the same as the first game. You go from A to B, collecting items and fighting enemies. In this game's case though, a lot of enemies. The items you collect typically open up new paths, and occasionally you'll fight a boss or two. And everybody loves fighting them. Everybody. 
DMC2 also has the shortest mission length in the series, with Dante having 18 missions to play through, and Lucia having 13. Objectively, this would make Lucia the better character to play through. Unfortunately, she has two underwater missions. And they're from a third person perspective, with fixed camera angles. It's been rumoured that for most of its development, the game was directed by an angry ghost. With only five months left of development, the Azure and Amber Emperor began to grow impatient. And by his decree, Hideki Itsuno descended from the heavens, atop a golden pegasus. He vanquished the spectre and finished the game. Well, he did what he could. The MC2 story is very light on content, so a lot of this will be interpretations. As any good sequel would, DMC2 takes place in a more horrific setting than a gothic castle. Rural Europe. In DMC2, Dante travels to rural Europe as demons are seeking out artifacts called the Arcana. There, he meets a girl called Lucia and an old lady called Mathieu. They explain to him that an evil billionaire is actually in league with demons, who'd have thought it? And he's using his influence and power to try gain these magical artifacts and become god. And then, the building that they're all standing at gets drone striked. Who knew that DMC2 was political? They try to hire Dante to assassinate this man, and they offer to tell him his story instead of paying him a fair wage. Which in turn, Dante replies with... Call it. Call it, yes. But first, Dante must collect the Arcana, so Arius can't. From here, the story takes a bit of a backseat. Dante collects a couple of the Arcana, he finds himself a motorcycle, he fights a tank, two, two, two tanks, three tanks, okay, three tanks. He goes to an oil rig, and he meets the man himself. Unfortunately, Heihachi escapes, so Dante fucks around for a bit longer, finds the last of the Arcana, and climbs the tower of Ouroboros HQ. After finding his way to the top, he finds that Heihachi has captured Lucia. So, he just gives him the Arcana. Just straight up. Except he includes a little Dante trick. Is there a problem? Is that... the Medallia? You sweet step! Pause coin? Showtime. Oh. No. My tree. My life. I was going to be the king of this world. King? Yeah. Here's your crown. Despite the fact that the ritual was incomplete, for some contrived reason, the portal to hell is still open. So Dante steps through the portal, fights the only good boss battle in the game, and then drives all the way to Brazil. And that's the entirety of Dante's story. Now on to Lucius. Did you really think you could deceive me? Have you come back to me? Um, you joker! She manages to get her hand on the first arcana towards the start of the game. After that, she eventually hunts down Arius, where he reveals to her that she is a clone of his demon bodyguards. Which is kind of a plot twist they already used, like one game prior, with the other female lead. You know... The rest of her campaign is either being just behind where Dante is and not helping out, or ahead of him and still not managing to do the job. Eventually, she goes to kill Arius herself, but she gets captured. No! Skip forward to after Dante saves her and walks through the portal, and Arius gets back up, and quite literally becomes a Resident Evil boss. She manages to defeat him, and then waits at Dante's place for him to return from Brazil as she tries to contemplate who she is as a person, rather than what she is as a person. 
It seems rather clear that they wanted to flesh her out more, but just didn't have the time and resources. Which is a shame, because she was far more fun to play. Despite everything, this game is very middle of the road. Having said that, I do still have a fondness for it, and actually enjoyed the majority of my time with it. But that doesn't excuse the rest of it. And that is why I recommend to everyone listening to play this game and suffer with me. I'm not finished with the series just yet, but next time, expect something a little different. Until then, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.